ahead and take a seat, and as you do so, take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on, uh, and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans is in the New Testament, so you're looking for like the last one-third of the Bible. Um, And so you'll go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then the book of Romans, which is where we're at. Uh, If you get to a book that ends in I-A-N-S, you've gone too far. Uh, So you hit 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, any of those that end in those four letters, you've gone too far back up. If I've confused you, go to the table of contents. That's why God gave it to us. Um, don't, don't feel bad in doing that. There are, a lot of, there are 66 books in the Bible. It's hard to find them sometimes. So Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to be this morning. Now, as you're turning there, I've got a question. Have you ever gone through something difficult or maybe endured something for a long period of time knowing that there was going to be a reward at the end? Uh, Have you ever done something like that? Uh, Okay, so ladies, let me give you an example. Ladies, have you ever cut your hair and then realized I miss my long hair and so you went through the process of growing it back out but you go through the phases of, oh, it's, it's not quite short but it's not quite long and now it's just annoying me and I've got to go through this process of letting it get long. My wife has gone through that process about seven times since we've been married. Um, She'll grow her hair long and she's like, okay, I'm done with it. She whacks it off and then a few months later, she's, oh, I miss my long hair. And so she goes through that process and she inevitably, a few months into the process of growing it back out, goes, oh, I can't pull it completely in a ponytail, but I can't do this and it's not quite long and it's not quite, right? And that's what, that's part of that process of enduring I got to get through this weird phase right now to get through to where I want it to be. Guys, what about growing facial hair? If you've ever had a goatee or a beard, there's a process. Uh, I didn't always have this big, beautiful beard. Um, the, the, why do you laugh when I say that, people? But I used to have nothing but a goatee. Uh, and my, I met my wife with a goatee. I've always had some form of facial hair. Believe me, you don't want to see me without facial hair. A bald guy that has like a 12-year-old's chin, it's ugly. But anyways, you go through this process, guys, of growing a beard, and a few weeks in, you go through the itching phase, right? If you've ever grown facial hair, you know what I'm talking about. It itches so bad that all, the only thing you can think about, the all-consuming thought in your mind is to keep your hands from reaching up and just, ah, you know, scratching it like crazy, Um, I went through the process. I grew it out in 2011 because I was playing Jesus in our passion play. And so I went through the itching phase and then came the persecution. The, why are you growing that out? When are you gonna cut that off? Well, I'm not because I'm playing Jesus and I'm more holy than you, so shut it. (laughs) I didn't say that, but that's what I thought a lot of times. Um, And in 2011, I had a one-year-old and so I went through the phase where Knox would reach up into my beard and he would he felt thought it felt cool to to rub it but then inevitably he would start doing that and he would clench and start yanking and use my beard as a pull-up bar you know that hurt Um, but there are all these weird phases that I went through but then at the end I had this amazing Jesus-like beard Um, and so that was really cool but I play it up and I laugh about it, but we've all gone through some kind of like uncomfortable or painful process knowing that we were going to get something at the end, haven't we? Uh, For many of us in the room, that may be work. Yeah, I love my job, but I know that some of you in this room basically do your job. The only reason you do it is for the paycheck, right? You go to work and you endure work because you know you'll get paid for it. Uh, So there's a process that we all go through, some process of doing something uncomfortable or painful, and the reason we do that is because we get some kind of reward at the end. Um, So that's what we're actually talking about today. That's what Romans chapter 8, the passage we're on today, speaks about. So I want you to look down at Romans chapter 8. We're actually going to pick up where Chad left off, off last weekend in verse 17. Uh, That was the last verse he looked at last week, but we have to look at 17 in order to move into the passage today. So look at verse 17 of Romans 8, and it says this. 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So the whole passage that Chad spoke about last week was the fact that we, as followers, we are children of God. And if we're God's children, then we are heirs to God's kingdom. We're fellow heirs with Christ. And that's what this passage is saying. So second half of verse 17, provided, so we're heirs as long as provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Okay, now look at the first word of verse 18. For, now Here's a little note. If you read your Bible and you're looking for something to kind of, oh, that's an interesting thing to, to acknowledge. Anytime you see the word for or therefore or because or anything like that, you know that the verse you're reading is saying, you just read this, now this. So when we read the verse 18 and the first word is for, we know that it's referring back to the verses before verse 18. That's why we had to read verse 17. So, Paul is saying we have to suffer with Christ in order to be glorified with him. Then verse 18, For, knowing that, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now catch that. We're going to come back to this idea of hope. But we, it, we, basically creation has been subjected to futility, but it's been subjected through that for hope's sake. Now pick up in verse 21. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies." Okay, now, uh, let's break this down. Let's look at what this passage is telling us. First, this passage is telling us that difficult times are part of life. Difficult times are part of life. That is a fact of life, isn't it? This life is not all rainbows and unicorns. It's not. As much as we would like life to just be pleasant and without pain or discomfort, that's not what reality is. Life is full of difficult parts of life. So let's just call it out, life sucks. It does. So you probably woke up this morning and maybe you went outside and you went, oh, it's a little warm, but it's kind of nice right now. But after this service, you're going to walk outside and you're going to go, this is miserable. It's 107 degrees with 70% humidity. This is awful, right? There's a reason why half our population moves away from Havasu for half the year. But think about it for a second. They move back because where they move to, what do they get during the winter? Snow. That's miserable. Oh, Ice falling from the sky. That's awful. So the fact of the matter is, is this world is full of discomfort and misery. Now think about something outside of the weather. The fact of the matter is, is we get hurt, don't we? If I walk up to you and punch you in the stomach, that's going to hurt. How many of you have stubbed your toe on a piece of furniture? You know how big your toe is? It's teensy tiny. You stub it on a piece of furniture, what do you feel? I'm gonna die! Because it hurts. It's miserable. It's awful. Think about this. As we age, our bodies stop working right, don't they? Some of you in the room are going, preach it, brother! Because you're going through that right now. The fact of the matter is, is as we age, our bodies break down. They stop working the way they want, that we want them to. It's part of life. It's part of what life involves. Bad things happen to us, don't they? 
As bad things happen, circumstances that are completely out of our control happen to us and they're not good. They hit our checkbook. They hit us physically. I mean, guys, I just went through last week, I have a nine-month-old boy that caught some random virus and was running 103 plus temperature most of the week. It was miserable watching that baby suffer, not knowing or understanding why he's suffering. That's awful. But here's the thing that I want you to see in this passage. Why do we suffer? Why do we experience all these bad things in this life? Well, verse 21 says that the reason for all of this is because all of creation is under the bondage to corruption. Bondage to corruption. So what is that? We are enslaved, basically, to the sin of this world. The sin of this world has damaged everything in creation. The moment Adam and Eve ate from that fruit, everything went downhill from there. Your sin, my sin, your neighbor's sin, the sin from the guy that lives on the other end of the planet, the sin that was committed 2,000 years ago, all of that sin ripples through creation and affects everything it touches. Your body is breaking down because of sin. My nine-month-old got sick this past week because of sin. Sin hits us. It damages us. It destroys us. So the fact of the matter is, is the reason that difficult times are a part of life is because sin is in this world. But here's the thing. The difficulties of this life are nothing compared to eternity in heaven because think about it if all of our suffering is a result of sin the fact that we get sick that we hurt that we get damaged that we get too hot or too cold all of those discomforts if all of that is a result of one thing it's all a result of sin and heaven is a place where sin does not exist can you imagine what heaven's going to feel like? Can you imagine how amazing heaven is going to be? The fact of the matter is, is you will never get sick. You will, your body will exist for eternity and never get hurt and never break down. You will never have to go to a hospital. You will never have to watch a nine-month-old struggle with 103.4 temperature. You can get hit by a bus and it will not hurt you. You won't get hit by a bus because getting hit by a bus would be caused by sin. The fact of the matter is, is sin won't exist. That is eternity. That is why nothing in this life is compared to heaven. The illustration that Paul, Paul's the guy who wrote the book of Romans. The illustration that Paul uses in verses 22 and 23 is the illustration of childbirth. And, and this illustration speaks to me on a high level. Uh, because when we moved here over eight and a half years ago, my wife Jana was pregnant with our first son, Knox. Uh, and her pregnancy, I'll just call it out, her pregnancy was miserable. We are not that couple. You know, there are two kinds of pregnant ladies in this world. There's the pregnant ladies who go, oh, my pregnancy was wonderful. As a matter of fact, I wish it would have gone 50 weeks instead of 40 weeks because it was just beautiful. My wife's pregnancy was, get this kid out of me. I hate this. It was miserable. It was awful. It, I'm, granted, there were sprinklings of a few beautiful moments, but overall, it was a horrible experience. My wife got pregnant the very next week that we found out she started getting the morning like sickness stuff. And she was sick for three months straight. She lost weight the first three months of her pregnancy. Pregnant women are supposed to gain weight, right? She lost almost 10 pounds in the first three months of her pregnancy because she was so sick. We got through those first three months and she went, Oh, I feel a little better now. And then we got to week 24 of the pregnancy, just past the halfway mark. And if you were here, you may remember this, but we got to the 24-week mark. She went for a regular checkup with her doctor, and the doctor went, um, you're in labor. And before the end of the day, she was in a helicopter being air vac to Phoenix for preterm labor, and they were afraid that the baby was going to be born at 24 weeks 
the first week of viability, technically on, from medical terms, they were afraid this baby was gonna be born. A miserable, fearful experience. Like, I don't ever wanna repeat that. But the fact of the matter is, is God, in his miraculous, amazing ways, he kept that baby in Jana until he was healthy. He was born just before the 37 week mark. And so, amazing, miraculous circumstance, but coming out of that, I remember thinking, man, this was crazy, and I'm so glad to have a baby, but we will never do this again, (laughs) ever. My wife will never want to be pregnant again. But what happened a few months later? Ladies, you know what I'm about to say, right? You have this horrible, awful birthing of a child, and then what's the next thing that happens a few months down the road? You get healed up, and what do you say? I want another baby. What? (laughs) Do you not remember what happened three months ago? It was awful. There was screaming involved. We don't have a lot of screaming in my household. You screamed in that moment, and you want to do that again? Uh, Okay. Okay. Fast forward six years, we're pregnant again with my second son, Declan. And still not a pleasant experience, but not as bad as with Knox. But think about it. Just the giving birth process is bad enough, right? I mean, women, I have the utmost respect for you. You know, you are my heroes and the champions of this world because I get a cold and I think life's going to end. You ladies give birth to babies. Like that in and of itself physically scares me to death. I could never do that. So kudos to you ladies and you moms out there because you're my hero. You, what you do is amazing. But the fact of the matter is, is despite all of that misery that we went through, to have those two boys, the, the hospitals, the sickness, the giving birth, oh, all of that, was 100% worth it because this is what we got out of it. This is the result, right? Every single one of you go, oh yeah, that was worth it. Because look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I have the two most beautiful boys on the face of the planet and none of your arguments saying your kids are cuter, all of those are crap in my eyes because those are the two cutest boys on the face of the planet. And I don't want to hear your arguments because they don't matter. The fact of the matter is, on a serious note, the fact is, is that that right there made all of that pain and suffering worth it, didn't it? That right there made the hospital visits, made the sickness, made the process of giving birth to them. All of that is worth it because of what we got in the end. That nine months... put together 18 months of total misery, it's worth it because of what I got as a result. But think about it for a second. We live on this earth a miserable existence. I'm hot. I'm cold. It's 70% humidity outside. I'm miserable. I got sick. I broke my knee. I hurt this. I, you know, All of that stuff is miserable, but In the end, if we follow Jesus Christ, what's the end result? We get heaven. All of the misery is worth it if we get the reward. That's why Paul uses the illustration of childbirth. And let's not sugarcoat this. When Paul wrote this passage, there was no such thing as painkillers. The fact of the matter is, is this is a perfect illustration of this life. It's miserable, it's painful, it sucks. But the fact is, is the end result makes it worth it all day long because we get a perfect existence in heaven. Which leads us into the second part of this passage. So look back down at Romans 8. And I want, we're gonna pick up where we left off in verse 23. So Romans 8, verse 23, it says this. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now remember, I told you we were going to come back to this idea of hope. Here it is, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. 
Let me read that again because this is important. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. You see the first passage that I read, verses 18 through 23, that was all about why suffering happens. It was all about sin and how sin has affected the world. The fact of the matter is we sin. Every single person who has ever lived on the earth except for Jesus has sinned. And that sin ripples across creation and damages and destroys in its wake. But then we get to this, verses 24 and 25 tells us, okay, now you've just seen the suffering and why it happens. Now here's how you get through that suffering. Here's the how to endure. And this, it simply comes to this. Hope is what gets us through. Hope is what gets us through. If Jana went through that nine months of misery and there was no hope of a beautiful baby at the end, that would have been a miserable experience with probably no redemption. That would have been very hard to get through, wouldn't it? Spiritually, this life, we need hope in this life, don't we? Because there are times when hope seems pretty thin. But this passage tells us that hope is what gets us through. The hope that Jesus Christ provides, right? It's the hope that can only be found in Jesus. That hope that when he died on the cross and saved us, forgave us of our sins, and then rose from the grave on the third day and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, that act, his existence, his sacrifice and victory over sin and death gives us hope. It's that hope that gets us through this miserable existence on earth. It's that hope that helps us endure. Your hope is everything. Hope in Jesus, hope in salvation, hope in the power that God provides, hope in our future existence in heaven, hope in our redemption and renewal. That is what gets us through. Listen to how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. It says this, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. How many of you can identify with that? Your bodies are wasting away. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, listen to this, the things that are seen are transient. They're temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. You see, your suffering, my suffering, the suffering of this world is temporary. This, this existence, this physical existence is the dream. This is the part of existence that's not real. This is the test. This is the practice for the real game. This is not the important part. This is the part that's preparing us for the important part. So if this life on earth is temporary, if this life on earth is not reality, and eternity, the forever is reality, where should we be investing our time and our efforts? And what matters, right? I mean, think about the comparison here. You on this earth will live somewhere between 70 and 100 years probably. I hope, to be honest, I hope I don't make it that long. But the fact of the matter is, is if you live a long life, you're going to expect to live between 70 and 80 years on this earth. What is 70 to 100 years compared with forever? It's nothing. Your life, the Bible describes it, your life is like the mist that comes out of your mouth on a cold day and you see it one moment and it's gone the next. Compared to every breath you take your entire life. This life is nothing compared to eternity. We suffer, we endure because we have the hope of what's really gonna happen forever. The hard part for us as Americans is that 
we live in a society and have grown very comfortable in an immediate gratification type society, right? We go through the drive through at in and out and if it takes more than three and a half minutes, we get frustrated, right? Let's be honest. What's taking so long? I'm hungry. I want my food now. Where's my double-double? But the fact of the matter is, is that God is calling us to wait patiently for years and years and years, right? But what do we get out of those years and years and years of patience? We get forever. And that's where our investment should be, is in the forever. So live in hope. But what does that mean? What does it mean to live in hope? It simply means this. When life gets oppressive, when life gets difficult, when nothing seems to be going right, when that hole that you're in just seems to get deeper, when there doesn't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel, you live in the hope. And it's about mindset. It's about where your heart and your mind is focusing. When you get in those difficult places, when you... When life doesn't seem to be going your way, when, when that light, you can't see that light at the end of the tunnel, rather than focusing on what the earth, what the world tells us to focus on, rather than focusing on what's going on in the physical and our own understanding, we rather focus on the hope that only Christ can provide. When we focus and we dwell on the hope, that helps us to endure the difficulty of the now. And so we need to learn to have the mindset to think and focus on the hope that's found in Jesus. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 9 talks about when we have worries, when we have anxieties, when we're stressing, we're supposed to give those to God. And it says through prayer and supplication. In other words, we pray and we go, God, this sucks. This is miserable and I hate it. But then it goes on to say, with thanksgiving. Present those things to God through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And the idea being, no matter how bad your life is here on earth, there's always something to be thankful for. Even if there's nothing physically to be thankful for, you can be thankful that your eternity is ready. That you are saved through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So it says, through prayer and supplication, give your request through, with thanksgiving, give your request to God. And it says this, and many of you may have heard this before, and then the peace that passes all understanding will be given to you by God. But then Paul takes it a step further, and he instructs us not to just give those things to God with thanksgiving and allow that peace to come. He then says, and things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there's anything of excellence, anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things. In other words, rather than dwelling and wallowing in our misery, and rather, rather than complaining continuously about how hard our life is, we dwell on the godly things. We dwell on the good things. Now, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this because I know that there are people, and we've, many of us have been with people who have gone through this, or, or maybe we're kind of on the cusp of experiencing it ourselves, but there's a difference between that life-shattering experience of death and just going through a difficult time, right? Uh, we, we will all experience death, guys. Uh, four out of four people that are born die. That's a fact of life. But that fact, we have to prepare ourselves for when that comes. And for some of us, that experience of death is going to be quick. For some of us, that experience of death is going to be drug out and it's going to last a long time and it's going to be awful and miserable and painful. But even in that drawn out, long, painful experience of death, we can still have hope of eternity. As a matter of fact, in that moment, we can have more hope for the eternity because we're closer to it. The fact is, is we have to learn and prepare ourselves for the mindset that Christ calls us to have in those difficult times. So rather than focusing on what everybody else focuses on, we focus on the beautiful things that God has done for us and is doing for us. Because I can guarantee you this, if you go through those difficult times and you endure them because of the hope that Christ provides, 
not only will Christ give you the strength and the, the peace that surpasses all understanding, but other people will notice. And believe me, they will want the hope that gets you through the difficult times. People can come to know Christ because of how you endure difficulty in your life. Join me in prayer.